Um, thanks so much for coming this morning. I know it's on the earlier side for one of our special seminars, but um, I'm excited to hear about what you have to say. So thank you so much. We have Mark this morning here from Duke um, with a bit of an engineering background to talk to us about uh, risk analysis. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, this is part of the larger um, participant in the larger games, decisions, risk, and resilience, if I remember the acronym correctly, um, program, and maybe many of you are as well. Um, and one of the elements of that is adversarial risk analysis. Um, I, um, I mentioned, there was mentioned, I'm, I'm at Duke, I'm in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Um, my background is with an interest especially in environmental modeling and uncertainty analysis, um, especially as it might inform decision making. So that touches on Bayesian decision theory. Um, and more recently, I've gotten into game theory, but um, oftentimes the applications that I work on are related to the environment and climate change. Um, I haven't worked specifically in adversarial risk analysis before, but I've been following the development of it and for a few years now. I've been quite interested in seeing how it might apply to some things that um, I've been thinking about. Um, simultaneously, we got a small pilot grant from Duke to begin some work on um, the strategic elements of geoengineering. And so what I'm hoping today is to share with you um, some information that we've gathered on geoengineering, some initial thoughts that we have about um, some of the interesting um, strategic dynamics and risk elements to it, and then hopefully maybe um, get some input or start some collaborations around how adversarial risk analysis might apply. I have some early um, thoughts on that that I'll share, but certainly nothing um, fully formulated. Um, so that's, that's where we'll go with it. So I titled it Adversarial Risk Analysis of the Geopolitics of Geoengineering, so specifically looking at strategic interactions among nations. I'm sure you're all familiar with climate change. I'm not going to go into the details, but one of the things that plots like this raise that is a bit um, scary is um, under baseline projections, which certainly seems to be those that we're on these days, um, the climate is likely to change quite a bit. Um, this is looking at greenhouse gas emissions, but related temperatures are expected to be extreme. And we're almost getting, the scientists, climate scientists are saying, kind of beyond the point where we're going to be able to turn this around to get it um, down to you know, safe levels that don't have some significant risk. And so as every day passes, we look for additional options that may involve um, quicker responses than we might get from um, greenhouse gas mitigation. Greenhouse gas mitigation is going to be certainly the important, essential um, solution in the long term, but it takes a number of years before that even begins to take effect. And so what people are looking at, are looking at and you may have seen this in the news, is um, technical so the technological solutions, um, geo so-called geoengineering solutions. You'll see headlines that can be a bit scary at times, um, sometimes either presented as a panacea or presented as um, you know, another Pandora's box. And so headlines like, you're giving the sun the answer to global warming, or geoengineering our last hope, or false promise. Um, uh, planet hacking becomes more urgent and terrifying than ever. Um, protest groups against this, um, ties to conspiracy theories on chemtrails. So it's obviously already become, if anybody knows about it, anything about it at all, it's presented as a contentious issue. Um, and yet, it very well may be um, what needs to be done, at least in the near term, to buy us some time. Yep. What is a chemtrail? Oh, <laughs> good question. A chemtrail is um, when you see airplanes and you see them flying, they leave behind a uh, trail. Um, most of us recognize that that's just a phenomenon that occurs in the atmosphere as a result of water condensation. People that are uh, more suspicious think that um, airplanes are regularly releasing chemicals um, either as a means to um, somehow subdue the population in some way or alter the climate. And so if you um, Google chemtrails, you'll find all kinds of conspiracy theories around what they really are. Um, and you'll get scientists who, um, probably fringe scientists, who say that you know, under conditions, um, normal conditions, airplanes wouldn't release these kinds of trials, and so that just lends some credibility to it. Um, but this is, in the public eye, oftentimes, geoengineering and chemtrails are somehow linked. Um, you might you know, start to see why, if you're not paying attention, why that might be the case. Um, before I get into that, I want to just clear up what is geoengineering, because there's oftentimes a lot of technologies that are described as geoengineering. 
Um, and this is presenting a host of different strategies, and I'll get into those um, in subsequent slides. But <coughs> at the fundamental level, there's two categories of geoengineering. Carbon dioxide removal. Um, this is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and the, the goal would be to return the climate to its previous states. Um, this could happen through carbon sequestration, either biologically or technologically, storing it in the earth in the form of soil or in the form of um, uh, storage of carbon dioxide in, um, in the geology, in, um, in, in the lower, um, what should I say, lower cavities of the earth. Um, the other option is solar radiation management, or SRM. This is actually reflecting or limiting the incoming sunlight in a way that offsets the warming that's expected from greenhouse gases. It's not an attempt to return the Earth to its previous climate states. It's creating new climate conditions that are somehow seen as being favorable relative to those that we might face under climate change. It doesn't reverse climate change. It offsets it, which has some other effects. Um, Carbon dioxide removal is relatively innocuous. Of course, it'll take up land. It's technologically not entirely proven at a large scale yet. But since you're removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it's, there aren't tremendous side effects, right, other than on the local scale, perhaps, by the scale of these things. Um, and at a global level, it's simply as if we were to not have emitted as much. Um, solar radiation management is much more controversial. So, yeah. So what would be the local, in, in, in the case of carbon dioxide, yeah. would be the, what would, could be the local side effects? The scale, just land conversion mostly. So either um, maintaining forests in a different way than you would, uh, might otherwise, or replanting forests, or um, stimulating the oceans um, to, so algae would take up more, which could have some local impacts on the biology or ecology. Um, this, if you had artificial, um, technological methods of bringing it in, you know, you might have a large scale um, industrial site kind of thing and then underground storage. Solar radiation management has a variety of different technologies. Um, perhaps the most um, maybe intriguing, but also maybe the most science fiction related ones is space related ones. Um, you might be able to put particles in space or some kind of large umbrella or mirror. Um, if you put it at the Lagrange point, um, between the Earth and the Sun, it would move, and other than maybe some small manipulations that would be necessary. It would take a lot of um, energy to keep it in place. Um, and so um, you could put something out there to kind of shade um, the incoming radiation. We're only talking about one or two percent of the radiation is all that would be needed to offset um, global warming, and so it's not a huge amount. But nevertheless, um, an umbrella or a shade or a parasol, whatever you might want to call it at that point, would need to be about the size of the continental United States, so it's not small. Um, uh, so getting it there would be expensive, and developing it and everything, but it's not probably possible. Um, another, which is, looks at the level of the stratosphere, so this is moving down from outer space down to the closer to the Earth's surface, is so-called aerosol injection. Um, this is injecting aerosols, small particles, via either airplanes, um, maybe balloon, weather type balloons, artillery, ar artillery into the stratosphere. Um, and this would essentially provide a kind of shading right, to these um, aerosols. Um, and I'll be talking more about this in a few minutes because this is what we're focusing on. It seems to be the most feasible. Um, it's actually, um, in many ways, the best understood because uh, we've had historical models of this in the, um, in the form of volcanic eruptions. So Mount Pinatubo, for example, was a large volcanic eruption that actually did cool the Earth globally. And so people are looking at sulfur dioxide as the major aerosol, in part because it's best understood from historical volcanic eruptions, although there could be other particles as well that could um, um, serve the purpose better uh, in a more directed way. Um, and we'll talk about that. Moving down to the troposphere, this would be um, the technique. It is called marine cloud brightening. The idea here um, it would be this is if you have autonomous ships constantly moving around the oceans, um, spraying fine sea water mist into the air. Um, um, ships already do this to some extent naturally in storing up water and releasing um, um, water vapor. And you can see these tracks from space of, of large tracks where ships, um, shipping routes are. Um, if you were to do this intentionally, you could lighten, um, that is, whiten the ocean surface in a substanti substantial way such that the reflection would increase um, and that would heat the oceans less um, and have a global impact in terms of cooling. 
Um, another way to accomplish this would be to distribute either small white plastic discs or some other reflectors or micro bubbles on the ocean surface in such a way to increase um, albedo or reflectivity. Um, that's, that's perhaps at the land surface, painting roofs white, changing land use patterns to a lighter shade, um, spraying tarps over large areas. This is widely seen as not effective, at least not in roofs white, it's not a large enough land surface, um, but um, and, you know, it could be a contributing element. The idea here is all of these are either blocking the sunlight or reflecting it in some way. Yeah, the, last, uh, the, the plastic uh, yeah. thing that you mentioned? It's incompatible with uh, plastics in the ocean. That's <laughs> yeah. another problem. Right? Yeah, right. I mean, you'd need to uh, obviously constrain it in some way um, so that it didn't become distributed. Um, you know, the idea might be uh, designed to um, engineer these so that they would remain in the surface, that they wouldn't be taken out biologically, that they would be constrained. But, yeah. I'm going to focus on stratospheric stratospheric aerosol injection as the strategy. Uh, um, all of what I'm going to talk about is to a certain degree um, not dependent on the particular strategy that we use because I'm talking more about the idea of geoengineering, but I did want to get into this just because it has some characteristics that make the problem interesting. It's extremely cheap. Um, it would cost an order of billions of dollars rather than trillions of dollars. When I say trillions of dollars, that would be the estimate for greenhouse gas mitigation on a global level to get us back down to, or keep us below something like two degrees warming. Um, you could cool the earth to the same degree with the expenditure of only billions of dollars. These are estimates, the technology isn't fully developed, but it's straightforward. It's, um, it's high altitude airplanes that have a cargo of, of these aerosols that they release. Um, you'd have to do it almost continuously. They'd have a lifetime of, or half-life of about a year, year and a half. So you need to maintain this. Um, but we're regularly flying airplanes um, during the Cold War. We were flying bombers around the world, thousands of them, um, and so it's not unheard of. Um, it's extremely effective. You could reduce the Earth estimates by models, say that you could reduce the um, global average temperature by multiple degrees Celsius um, relatively quickly within a matter of months or a year. Um, it's, as I'm saying it's extremely fast acting and in the order of years rather than decades um, for mitigation even if we were to reduce greenhouse gases in the near term. You could treat, treat the dosage easily, so if you weren't getting the effects you wanted, it would be easy to add more or um, not as much because it has a short half-life. Importantly from the perspective, perspective of strategy is it does not rely on collective action, right? So I'll talk more about this, but greenhouse gas mitigation, climate change mitigation, in order to be effective, requires collective action in which all nations, or at least all major nations, would need to participate. Um, and there's lots of reasons why we're not inclined to do that, why we don't have a history of success in that. Um, you could pretty much, at the cost of billions and the scale which could operate, one nation could easily implement this on their own. In fact, it's been said that even you know, a billionaire could begin to implement this. A corporation or an individual had enough money to get this started. Um, this could prevent dangerous climate change. So my initial plot showing the rise in, um, in greenhouse gas uh, concentrations and the associated rise in temperature is seen as generally dangerous. And so you could imagine a scenario, um, people have written uh, kind of, at this point, kind of near-term fictional scenarios in the not too distant future where we have more hurricanes, we have more dramatic signs of climate change, countries are desperate to alleviate this, and this might be something we would resort to. Um, even if we hadn't fully thought it out, um, we developed it, deployed relatively quickly. <coughs> so it could be a kind of viable emergency response. The people who are researching this and doing it in a kind of responsible way are saying that um, we should only use this as a means to buy us time. It shouldn't be the solution in the long term, but it can buy us time as we transition to carbon-free energy sources. Um, it has certain environmental impacts, meaning ones that aren't unknown, um, direct impacts, um, direct environmental impacts of employment, deployment are relatively low. It mainly might be some impacts to the workers who are developing this um, or loading it if there were an accident. Um, there are very few direct environmental impacts. Um, you maybe get a little bit of acid rain in some areas, but depending on the material, if it was sulfur dioxide, um, other materials wouldn't have that effect. There's calcium-based substances. There are fully engineered um, particles, like microparticles, nanoparticles that could be used. 
um, and generally believe the direct environmental impacts are pretty minor. You'd have less sunlight, about one or two percent less, which would have an effect on solar power. Um, it may have some ecological impacts. I'll get to that as an uncertain impact. We know these are direct certain impacts. You'd have less sunlight for solar power, which might hamper our ability to meet renewable energy goals, but again, only a couple percent. You see sky whitening. That doesn't just mean dimmer, but actually whiter. If you have these particles, they would reflect at least non engineered particles would reflect light in all directions, not just back out into space, which would mean a lighter, whiter sky. Um, and um, people are talking about engineering nanoparticles that would be light on one side and dark on the other, so they would only reflect up. And if you could maintain their orientation, um, then that might be more effective. It does nothing for some other side effects of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is a direct result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This isn't removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so ocean acidification would continue to take place. Um, if the ocean weren't warmed as much, it might be mitigated slightly, but um, most of the result, most of the cause of ocean acidification is direct carbon dioxide. There's uncertain environmental risks that are unknown at this point. Um, there could be earth system effects um, in overall. The, um, uh, large-scale circulation patterns could be affected because light would be coming in and heat would be coming in um, with a different kind of pattern, um, both perhaps latitudinally, but also in terms of the distribution of light. Um, you would probably see different uh, distributions of regional precipitation patterns. People are concerned about how it might impact things like the South Asian monsoon. You might have risk of regional drought. In general, people feel like overall global precipitation would be reduced as a result of this. Um, the particles, this is, depending on the substance that's used, um, there could be a potential for them to add to ozone depletion because um, some of the substances could react with ozone and um, uh, recreate the ozone hole that's been kind of um, been being resolved since the Montreal Protocol. Um, and that might be able to be mitigated, but it's certainly something to be concerned about. I mentioned this before, it could change photosynthesis rates because of the change in sunlight. It could impact agricultural yields. Um, you might see higher acid deposition, as I mentioned. There's ethical concerns, and so I'm now getting more into kind of what we're interested in. Um, people see this as a slippery slope or a lock-in, right? So you could add a disincentive to mitigate to the degree to which we're encouraged or inspired to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions now by the effects of climate change. If this somehow hides or obscures the effects of climate change, um, then there may not be as much incentive to mitigate in the long run. The benefits and harms would be unequally distributed, probably depending upon who deployed it and what their strategy was in deploying it. Um, countries that were to decide to de deploy it would probably design it so that it would benefit them, um, which may mean not benefiting other countries to the same degree. Um, there might even be some impact we talked about monsoon impacts, for example, some potential for harm. Um, and the question would be who would um, assume liability for that, right? When we have climate change, its impacts are kind of, um, the liability is more distributed, right? It's kind of a sin of um, omission rather than a sin of commission, so to speak, right? We're omitting, we're not taking action on climate change, which somehow isn't being seen as having liability to the same degree that which if you were to engineer the climate, that would be committing, um, you know, um, taking some action. And if it impacted people, even as a, in perception of it as an impact, there could be some um, real concerns or potential um, uh, conflict. The implementation is potentially corruptible, right, in terms of exactly how it's implemented, um, who's implementing it, what reasons um, there are. It would leave an undue burden on future generations. It would push back the data which we really need to mitigate, really solve the problem. It's a kind of band-aid. Um, and so um, it would commit future generations to taking responsibility for this. And some people just see this as fundamentally wrong. Um, humans playing God and um, controlling the climate. Um, this technocratic modification of nature at a global scale, which of course we're already um, doing, but this would be again more proactive as opposed to reactive or um, as a second. Um, this disincentive to mitigate is especially concerning to a lot of people. Um, it's framed oftentimes in the risk literature as either a moral hazard or a risk compensation. If 
you're familiar with the term moral hazard, this is when one party increases its risk taking uh, because another party has assumed some of the responsibility. Uh, this is like if you have automobile insurance, you might be inclined to drive faster because um, your insurance company is responsible for the damage to the car, right? Um, risk compensation is when you increase risk in response to perceiving that your risk exposure is reduced. Um, like if you have airbags, you might drive slightly faster because you don't see yourself at risk with the airbags. It's unclear exactly, I mean, and it's almost a minor point, which of these is might be driving um, the perceived risk of uh, disincentive, disincentivizing mitigation, right? Is it a matter of a moral hazard where somebody else is somehow assuming the negative consequences or compensating for the risk? But these are kind of um, risk perceptual uh, justification or um, reasons why you might expect to see disincentives mitigation. There have been surveys about geoengineering, um, and it turns out at least stated perception is, is that um, when told that geoengineering might be a feasible option, people actually become more concerned about climate change rather than less. They see this as, I think the belief is, is that people see, well, if we're willing, or if we're, yeah, if as a society we're considering doing something as extreme as geoengineering, then it really must be a serious problem, and they um, see it as that we really need to do something about it in terms of mitigation. So behaviorally, at least stated behavioral um, impacts are that actually doesn't suggest that people would become less concerned, but more uh, concerned. So it's a bit of a paradox. Or uh, is there any behavioral evidence for moral hazard or risk compensation? In this in, in this capacity? Uh, it, actually, in almost any situation, I, I rarely think that people drive faster because yeah. they have seatbelts. Yeah. yeah, there is some literature on this. Um, uh, let's see, um, what would be some of the most, um, I'll figure back to you on some specific details, yeah, as to what evidence might be um, specific. I know people look at this and um, yeah, these are classic examples. I don't know, I'll need to get back. In, in cybersecurity, people talk a lot about uh, moral hazard in relation with cyber insurance and so on. Yes. Um, I, I'm not saying that it doesn't ever exist, but I think it may be a very yeah. small set. And the cyber insurance, I think, is complicated by an additional factor that people don't understand the actual risk of cyber attacks. So they, but another, another comment. Yeah. Or, or perhaps um, in the finance world, I mean, there seemed to be, um, with the large financial bailout, bailout, that was kind of a concern that financial institutions weren't taking serious, weren't serious enough about their risks because they might be seen as having the potential to be bailed out or having um, federal insurance. That is one kind of part. Uh, there are governance concerns, and again, I'm narrowing in on what we are interested in looking at. Um, as I mentioned, there might be regional differences in both the intended and unintended effects. And this could cause conflict. Um, there's a possibility of unilateral deployment, um, which could be selfish in the sense of a nation's own interest, or even potentially hostile deployment, this was raised early in the literature on geoengineering. I think the scale, at least of solar radiation management, would be so large that nobody could really deploy it in a way that would be, was either non-detectable or you know, ongoing. If, if, if a rogue actor decided to deploy this, they could easily be um, discouraged or um, prevented from it. So I don't think that's a major concern. Um, uh, possible weaponization or counter-deployment, again, that's been something that's kind of come out of Cold War thinking, um, is that if one country initiates it, the other would do something to offset it. It would probably be easier to take other um, actions to discourage deployment rather than counter-deploy some, counter, um, some other offsetting geoengineering. Um, but I guess it's something to consider. Um, perhaps most importantly is the so-called sudden stopping problem. Um, I mentioned you need to do this continuously. And so if one reason or another, either through, say, um, war or economic depression, the actors decided to discontinue it. You know, climate greenhouse gas concentrations would be presumably continuing to go up in the background. Um, and as I said, they, this SRM, solar radiation management, would be hiding that. So if you stop deployment, um, temperatures would suddenly rise back up to that level in a matter of months. And that would be catastrophic in the sense that we would be adapted to either humans or um, ecosystems, and so that could be a real concern. Um, so, P 
people have looked at this strategically from a game theoretic perspective. <coughs> people have long studied greenhouse gas mitigation um, in the context of game theory and have largely thought about the mitigation actions, that is the um, cost required to reduce carbon dioxide emissions or other greenhouse gases as a public good. Um, and so what this would do in most public good situations would encourage free riding or so-called tragedy of the commons. Um, I'll discuss more about that in a minute, but um, essentially saying that anybody is better off by letting others take care of the problem. This is you know, without thinking of geoengineering. Um, you know, we've got a socially suboptimal result, and that's the tragedy of the commons. Um, more recently, as the risks of climate change have um, become more apparent and um, possibly more severe, uh, people frame this as a so-called collective risk social dilemma. What that means is that there's the actual risk of catastrophe if we don't do something about it, and that seems to motivate um, collective action um, in um, behavioral experiments. So then you might get back to something that's socially optimal, and essentially scare people into doing something about the problem. Now, solar or geoengineering, um, we're thinking about as a, we're calling it a quick fix. It's not really a fix, but we chose this term as indicative of its fast response and the kind of um, per, the, uh, the everyday use of the term quick fix as a, as a partial or incomplete solution that might have side effects. Um, and um, interestingly, you could see why this might generate not a free rider, but a free driver. In other words, somebody would want to initiate this when it becomes in their own interest, even if it isn't in the interest of others because it is so cheap. Again, you might get a socially suboptimal result from that in the sense that um, it's not necessarily good for everybody. It may be um, worse for the globe as a whole. And I, this is a high, highly simplified, but maybe to begin to get into aspects related to um, adversarial risk analysis, this is just a, a simple two-player stylized representation of just the climate change problem. Um, it's a, a non-zero-sum game. Um, and so two players um, under recent historical conditions before geoengineering is added as a potential solution. Each player could either mitigate or do nothing, right? If they both mitigate, you're best off. Both players benefit. You solve the climate problem. Um, but if um, one player, uh, let's see, if one player mitigates and the other does nothing, then it only partially solves the problem. And the person, the country that mitigates um, also has hampered their economy if they both end up doing nothing, then they're both worse off, right? And so in the classic kind of prisoner's dilemma, they end up here, even though this would have been um, the better solution um, for society. Um, the collective risk social dilemma um, increases the downside of doing nothing, and then that would um, change the incentives such that both would be incentivized to mitigate. If we get to a state in which mitigation is no longer an option, or at least not seen as an effective option anymore, it's too late. So in other words, if we're considering nothing versus solar radiation management. Um, so um, in this case, solar radiation management would be the equilibrium strategy, both countries implementing it, um, right? Um, and kind of being living with what we have and doing the best possible conditions under that scenario. In fact, um, even if we look at all three options, um, um, mitigation, um, even if mitigation remains an option, you know, under, and again, this is stylized, but it captures some of the key um, incentives, you might likely be back in the kind of prisoner's dilemma where you're incentivized here. This is the equilibrium, even though this might be um, a better overall option, but either player is inclined to move to that because it would have, again, because of the, um, Rider. Now, what's interesting is um, if, if one nation actually doesn't have SRM as an option, it's not, not every country actually has the resources or the technology to implement it. And so if you eliminate that as an option from one country, what you do is you end up then moving to this as the equilibrium, which is an interesting one, right? Because it's actually advantageous for the country that gets to control the climate. They could actually control it to a state that's better than it had been before. Most countries would be better off if temperatures were slightly cooler than they have been historically. Um, but it would be worse off um, for the country who does nothing. They would be inclined to mitigate, right? So it's kind of a threat, so to speak, that if I'm going to, I'm going to implement solar radiation management, if I can, um, and then that might incline the other countries to have to mitigate. Yeah? 
sorry, are you allowing for the option of repeated games in your uh, theory with the uh, option of retaliation? Uh, I don't, possibly, right, so that's something I want to get into. If, um, so far not, I'm just looking at this as a one-time play. Um, of course, that's not it. Um, there could be retaliation, it's going to be that kind of game, just as a stylized version for now. My question to you all is along those lines, does this necessarily make it adversarial, right? One doesn't normally frame climate change as adversarial, but rather a kind of common um, um, problem where you need to cooperate. Um, but if you do get in a situation, again, in the stylized sense, where a country could threaten um, to implement solar radiation management, and if that other country doesn't have the option, um, then perhaps um, uh, we might find ourselves in this situation where one country is um, taking advantage, so to speak, of the mitigation actions of the other. Um, people have studied this um, uh, in a more sophisticated dynamic setting, um, just starting off with the two nation analyses. Um, what they find, not, perhaps not surprisingly, is, is that the um, equilibria are dependent upon the asymmetries in the nation's preferences and climate sensitivities. I showed you asymmetries in their technology capabilities. Um, others have studied whether nations are essentially what, how significantly they're impacted by climate change. Um, so if they're symmetric and if the expected damages are low, mitigation would be reduced in anticipation of future SRM. In other words, knowing this being an option would actually incur this kind of um, um, discouragement of mitigation. But if nations are highly asymmetric or damages are large, SAR, uh, SRM might lead to greater mitigation by the one nation to try to avoid um, implementation by the other, essentially what I showed stylistically in the last um, slide. Uh, to date, these haven't been tested against actual human behavior. These have just been simulations. I think I mentioned this on our um, phone call. We have a, a proposal in to NSF with some colleagues at Appalachian State who run a behavioral ex uh, economic behavioral economics experimental lab. Um, we're, we're planning some experimental games first to be implemented on everyday people, probably just students um, or members of the general public who are recruited, and then um, we. I've gotten the agreement to be able to get this funding to be able to do this at one of the um, council of the parties um, at, the UN, at the UN, so get the actual delegates or um, representatives and see how they may play it out. Um, so the game is highly stylized representation that really distilled this to its essence. Um, it's not even about geoengineering anymore. What it is, it's a, um, just a public goods game. So the representation of the game is you have players in a group. They have to decide whether they can, they have some, they're given some endowment, some resources, wealth. They have to decide whether they're contribute to a group account that represents the public good mitigation. If the total contributions of the group um, to the group account meet a target level, then you avoid the catastrophe or the risk of a catastrophe, that is loss of your remaining endowment. Um, this has been done quite a bit um, already. What we're adding is this kind of generic quick fix. Um, and so this becomes a variant of what's called the volunteer's dilemma. Essentially, any participant could volunteer or um, pull the trigger on a quick fix solution um, that, depending on the um, variant of the game, either solves the problem or solves it in the near term, either has impacts on other players or doesn't, um, but needs to step up and um, spend the money, make a contribution that would then provide this technological solution. Um, this decision is as an immediate cost to the volunteer, but lowers the probability of a catastrophe for everybody. Um, we also could explore whether, as I mentioned, we could have additional downtime risks done to other group members. Um, <coughs> kind of like side effects of the engineer. So we plan to do this as a single round, um, exploring the question of does the presence of this so single actor as opposed to group effort or collective action the single actor quick fix solution induce greater cooperation among everybody? Um, does the threat of somebody implementing this um, induce greater cooperation, or does it further promote free riding that is waiting for the volunteer? How does heterogeneity, especially in the endowments, impact the um, quick fix solutions and cooperative behavior? How well can players coordinate behavior with respect to this quick fix? Um, and then just if we want to get into the details, this is the experimental design. We'll have treatments that have to do with the initial endowments, you know, the climate sensitivity, um, how many players are needed, whether one player is enough to do this, whether um, 
one player is enough, but not everybody has the capacity, whether you need some cooperation, multiple players cooperating on this, whether they can talk or not. Um, for participants, we would need more power. Yeah. So can you theoretically get um, cooperation in a one-time game? Is that uh, possible? Not without communication. Experiments on individuals would be at all informative regarding uh, national level decision making? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they'll have the same considerations. Um, this is just an initial kind of saying, I think I've got this on the next slide. Um, we're presenting this not as, I think I've mentioned this maybe to some of you on the call. Um, we've submitted this proposal twice. Um, the first time we had the suggestion of the program officer to not Fragment so much as geoengineering, but inspired by geoengineering and really raising an interesting dilemma that applies to a variety of other situations. And I'll give you some examples of other situations. When we got the reviews back, um, some of the reviewers felt we weren't um, detailed enough about how this did apply to geoengineering. They thought that that was an important enough problem that that should serve to motivate it, and we should really try to get the stylized details of that correct. Um, and so we've been hedging a bit on how much it should apply. And what we finally came down to in this last submission is um, in our first aim, we'll work with the general public on um, recognizing that it may not apply to true climate negotiators um, for a variety of reasons. But maybe we can say something in general about human behavior in such a context. And then we would um, maybe put your effort in the second proposal um, and get the assurance that we could get the participation of negotiators or delegates to the council parties so that it would come closer. Um, we also plan a multi round game, um, so you know, where either there could be a potential for retaliation or where as climate change becomes worse over time, do they, and if they know that, do they hold out to implement this quick fix as a last resort, as people are expecting would be an emergency solution, or do they implement it before it's strictly necessary? Um, uh, um, what impact might the possibility of terminating the quick fix technology have on future actions and outcomes, either as a threat or as a risk? Um, do players take advantage of the opportunity to maybe reduce risks over time through learning? Um, this could be the relearning about their own climate sensitivity or learning over time about the potential effectiveness um, or side effects of the quick fix technology. So these are some other quick fixes that we raised just kind of loosely as being analogous to geoengineering that might apply to everyday people. Um, there's lots of technological quick fixes out there that are being proposed as solutions to what would otherwise be collective action um, dilemmas. And so, you know, an argument could be made that um, there are problems that normally require collective action, that these are problematic in a society where people may not want to cooperate, and we may lean on technological fixes um, to solve those that may be um, incomplete or um, have secondary, have secondary effects or side effects. Some might be, for example, gene editing. Um, we have a collaborator who's interested in exploring this. Um, they're particularly interested in gene drives as a means for eliminating malaria. Um, so this would be as opposed to, say, public health measures that would require broad spread participation um, to confront disease. Um, blockchain, for example, as opposed to transparency as a means for preventing fraud. Surveillance cameras versus, say, neighborhood watch as a way to thwart crime. Smart guns as opposed to training or social norms um, to avoid accidental shootings. So you know, these are kinds of emerging technologies. Um, and they're not perfectly analogous to um, geoengineering, but they have some of the same characteristics where we hope that we can learn something about people's willingness to adopt such technologies from our experiments with people. So my question, or where I'm looking for input on, and hopefully some, maybe some collaboration, is to what degree can um, approaching this as an adversarial risk analysis type problem shed light on this situation? There's been a history in climate change and in geoengineering of looking at it from a classical risk analysis perspective, from a game theoretic perspective. But I think in reality, it really um, doesn't meet most of the assumptions of those. Um, and so being a newbie to ARA, I'd be interested in um, getting your hints as to what might apply. Um, questions I have are, is this situation truly adversarial? Um, does it need to be? Um, or is it, you know, is it just a matter of not having common knowledge? There is a lack of common knowledge on 
each party's utilities, certainly, a lack of common knowledge about the probabilities of success of the technology. Um, and there's at least two layers there. The probability of being able to actually develop this technology, right, it's not yet available, and so it would require some commitment of R&D efforts to get there, which could have some lag time, um, and that could be secretive. Um, and so, and then, of course, deployment and success. Um, I don't think the attacker-defender analogy is exactly right. I don't think um, the general framing is, the, you know, I, I mentioned that some people talked about this as um, geoengineering being weaponized. I don't think that's the primary concern as much as just more of like a, I guess, a first mover, like whoever does it first um, has some significant impacts. It, they, essentially broken the norms against doing it, right? So if one country were to do it, it might inspire others to get on board, um, either cooperate or not. Um, and the first mover presumably would be the one who has control over the kind of global thermostat, right? This idea of geoengineering as a global thermostat, I think is a useful analogy. Your home is anything like mine, we can't even agree among our family what temperature to keep the thermostat at, right? So countries are gonna have their ideal temperature um, that they'd like it to be, and that's going to differ depending upon whether they're northern or southern latitudes, for example. Um, is there so, um, um, sorry, I'd like to get into Yeah. So, uh, for this last uh, thing that you mentioned, yeah. are there sufficient knowledge to forecast adequately the impact of, uh, I mean, the temperature in Spain will be between this and this? And yeah, so. But um, that, that in France would be that and that. There are. So, there's models available now, um, and so the very few. Um, uh, federally funded efforts on geoengineering have largely been model-based efforts. Um, and so there are a lot of models um, that people seem to be having some confidence in that are um, saying, basically, how they're being approached is, um, because there's no one way to do solar radiation imaging, right? You're gonna be flying these planes. You can, mo by modeling the geophysics of Earth, you could determine what would be the right latitude to distribute them, there's going to be actually some migration of the part aerosols towards the poles, and so um, you have to account for this kind of spreading. Um, and as Earth rotates, you know, it's going to be moving around. So it's not going to be distributed evenly. And depending on what your strategy is, you could accomplish warming at different different degrees of warming in different latitudes. Um, I think the most optimistic um, people think that you could um, design this such that it would minimize the negative impacts on any country. Um, but nevertheless, I think whoever designs it is probably going to have the incentive to maximize their own benefits. That may mean not maximizing the benefits of others. Um, I think that's one aspect of your question. The other aspect is, do we even know economically what's the optimal temperature? Um, I think so. I mean, there's uncertainties about that. But I think um, you know, if you wanted to kind of identify for different countries, what they're setting on the firms that they prefer. I think you get pretty good agreement on that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily correspond to historical um, uh, values. We had a, um, so this uh, uh, collaboratory, we have this pilot funding we have from Duke. We've been inviting a number of geoengineering researchers to come and speak to us about different aspects. And um, somebody came last week. And she had done some interesting modeling studies um, that look at um, if you three essentially three four scenarios. One, if you don't do geoengineering. One, if you do geoengineering to exactly offset um, the projected warming. Um, uh, one being just mitigating greenhouse gases to offset warming or to, uh, to avoid warming. And then the other being if you geoengineered as much in the reverse direction. So essentially cooling the Earth. Um, would that be better or worse? Um, and her result on this, and it's highly controversial, will come out in Nature Communications any day now or within the next couple of weeks. She shared with us the challenges she had in terms of reviewers, and I think rightfully so. But um, the projections are, just if you use all the models that are used for climate warming, but use them for climate cooling, that most countries would be better off um, because most, or most of the population would be better off most of the population is in climates that are too warm. Um, some countries in northern um, latitudes would be worse off, but most countries in mid-latitudes would be about the same. And so, um, and the inequalities among countries would be reduced, um, because largely because poor countries closer to the equator would be better off 
um, relative to richer countries in northern, um, especially in the northern hemisphere. And um, so that this could be potentially a good thing. She says she means this as being kind of um, provocative. Um, and a lot of reviewers, as they said, kind of, uh, these reviews will be published with articles, so I'm not giving anything away that's um, anonymous. Um, said that you can't apply models of climate change in the reverse direction, that they weren't designed for that. But um, she's been learning, our team is making our on that paper that that's not the case, that the premise for the models doesn't necessarily favor um, temperature changes in one direction or the other. So if you're going to believe the effects of climate warming, you've got to believe the effects of climate cooling. But it's philosophically or scientifically, logically, there's no difference in terms of how the models are applied. I'm not quite clear that's true, I guess. I but the point is less that, I think, than um, if we're going to get into geoengineering, there'd be no reason to stop, right? We're going to continue to cool it. Because what would be the baseline anymore, right? How would we even know when we've reached historical levels? Um, there's so much climate noise that we could make the point that we could cool it a little bit more and we'd all be better off. And at that point, the kind of norm against climate and or geoengineering is broken. And, you know, so um, I just, before we get into the discussion, I just want to make sure I give everybody um, proper credit. Gave myself as the author, this is myself as the author. Our small team at Duke includes um, people in my research group, um, and also um, John Weiner and Billy Pizer, who are both in Duke Law and um, Public Policy. We also have collaborators um, at Appalachian State that I mentioned, um, in, uh, uh, in Colorado State. Um, I mentioned Jennifer Cruz and also Eric Rieger, um, that are both at NC State, um, and they're interested in the public affairs aspects, especially as it relates to other technologies. Um, Juan Marino Cruz is an economist at Waterloo who's been studying this extensively, um, as well as to call back and use it since her in Boston. So this is the proposal team that we've been working together so far on this, um, on this side proposal. So ARA isn't explicitly a part of it, um, and, but um, either if we were to get the funding, I'd be happy to do some preliminary work in that direction, if you all saw it as a potential promising direction, or any of you were interested in collaborating either in the near term as part of this um, um, CMC working group or in the longer term in terms of the proposal, I think that would be fun. So, anyway, thanks for your attention. What's the stage of the experiments? Yeah, so they done, had done some initial, so I think I, think I have a slide on this one. Um, so there had been some very small scale experiments. There were some larger ones that were planned. There's a team at Harvard that's largely been pushing this, um, almost been a little bit proactive about um, climate and geoengineering, at least in the sense saying that we should better understand it so that if we were to apply it, we'd know what it was about. And they had had a, I guess you call it an intermediate level um, field, real world field experiment. Um, it had been shut down, um, largely because of a lot of public outcry. Um, initially, they were kind of proceeding with it as if it were just any other scientific experiment. People caught wind of it. And then they had this whole kind of public participation. Um, people came out against, you know, largely because of the slippery slope idea, or um, the lock-in idea, saying that we shouldn't even go down that path. And so um, they discontinued it. So right now, there aren't any um, experiments. The best experiment, so to speak, is studying lock-in corruptions. Um, will happen, you're not going to stop them. And if you can study them well, then you might get a better sense of what's going on. Um, there's not really, so many people who are working on this say that it's not, there's not really a good field experiment anyway, other than deployment, right? If you a small amount, it isn't going to really tell you whether you're getting these substantial cool and you're actually not able to at some larger scale. At that point, you really are starting to manipulate the climate, and it's unclear whether they ever get permission to do that. Oh, our experiments. I think you meant the field experiments. Oh, um, we had done some initial um, experiments as preliminary data um, and um, for the proposal. Um, and then now we're kind of holding off and waiting to see if we can find you. So you show that slide with the table of the design? And, yeah. Um, have, so, for example, have the recruited systems? No. You said that you didn't think that the optimal setting for the global thermostat is the same as historical settings. Yeah. And 
uh, and I, I agree, but I also want to point out that essentially every nation has sort of co-evolved their economy to optimize for their local conditions historically. Absolutely. And although Canada might be better off in the long run if it were a whole lot more, uh, there would still be enormous upfront cost in order to try and develop that. Yeah, absolutely. So these are kind of long-term equilibrium predictions rather than their transition. Right. So you know, whether we're transitioning to a warmer climate or transitioning to a cooler climate, there's going to be some concerns. Is there any evidence that um, nations or major decision makers look for long-term equilibrium? I think they probably have <laughs> a short-term horizon. Yep, probably not. So the United Nations and I mean the sort of meta yeah. mm -hmm. organizations yeah. are more long term. One would like to have long term plans. I'm not sure that they've been especially effective in any of the things that we need to worry about. So, uh, so um, again, it's, it seems like there's some potential promise here, right? I think the you know setting is such that. Um, Partly related to what you're talking about is, well, you know, scientists, um, economists can kind of get a sense of what is the optimal temperature setting for other countries. They may not really know what their motivations are, what is their utilities. They may not know either what their actual or perceived, I mean, there's no difference, perceived probability of successes or ability to implement this either politically or technologically. Um, when you just hear about this, maybe some of you for the first time, does this, does this strike you as being adversarial type problem of the kind that one would typically study using adversarial risk analysis? And is that term, that modifier adversarial, even an important one? Um, that is not essential for the types of analysis that ARA does. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you can certainly wind up in situations in which some of the players are totally cooperative, uh, and maybe even all of them. Um, in this case, if I were trying to structure it as an ARA problem, uh, I think that I would look at um, other decision makers. It's going to be a very large number of decision makers interacting, and they typically aren't going to be nations. They're going to be uh, multinational companies, uh, the coal industry, uh, a whole batch of entities like that. Uh, among the nations, realistically, Togo is not going to have much of a seat at the table when a decision like this gets made. So it'll be, to the extent nations are involved, it's going to be the United States, Russia, yeah. uh, China, India. Okay. Yeah. So you can either look at a handful of nations. How do you see the, what do you see the role of corporations coming in on, on the same level as nations, or is like a two-level analysis? I think it's much more than two level. It has more than two level. Yeah. Um, so well, multi stakeholder game uh, yeah. with several layers. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's, I guess, like in the economics, like there's going to be a trade-off between how realistic you attempt to make it versus we're trying to get some simple wide um, insights, right? So, what, but but it's probably a good. Uh, I mean, just to start with the two agents, two agents, and then yeah, think right. of uh, more or several. But yeah. I would start with a couple. <laughs> of That's what I'd like to. Yeah. Again, we're right. not necessarily heading in right now to a long-term project, but if we could show that it would be some interesting insights. Um, I think what is important is what. Uh, uh, he, he mentioned this. this uh, it's over time. Yeah. Um, one of the agents, for example, is more clever, has better research, uh, researchers, and gets better estimates of the probabilities than the other. So yeah. that, that that kind of uh, sequential is quite important. Okay. And you yeah. can do this kind of uh, reinforcement learning with multiple agents and other services and so on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And actually, in, in some, depending on. You, you, you make them to cooperate or depending on the incentives and the knowledge they gather so you, you can get all explore the all these interactions. And you see something it's fundamentally so people have looked at learning about climate change already, you know, that climate sensitivity the kind of main parameter as to how sensitive any country might be to changing in greenhouse gases. Um, and then you could maybe imagine learning that over time if you can get the and that means we're uncertain right now about what the impacts will be, but as um, climate change happens, we'll learn something about it. So people will look at it. Do you, do you see it first look like anything special about the geoengineering problem that would make it 
they're more interesting or different than that problem? Yeah, well, one is that there is an asymmetry in technology. Uh -huh. So one is there is a clever agent and the other is not so uh -huh. clever. So one uh -huh. is the US and the other okay. is Spain. <laughs> and that uh, you get, uh, I mean, so yeah. that might be quite interesting to so. yeah. To me, this idea of maybe um, limiting the options of other countries in such a way that then they end up doing something you know, that they might not have otherwise done without geoengineering as a threat is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, nobody might even articulate it as a threat, but seeing that as an option in a um, projection in a different way, like I showed with that simple table. Yeah. So I wonder if you might start off by designing your own Excel or Nuna menu. Okay. Where your strategies play against each other and yeah. see which one is separate. That, yeah. that was what was done in 1980s. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I wonder if there is a version that you are planning on developing. Like a, just a game? So, so basically, if you have a repeated game, it's yeah. hard to analyze theoretically, right? Yeah. So what was done in 1980s, and I'm not an expert on this, is that so David uh, Robert Axelrod is a political scientist in Michigan, yeah. and he has this tournament where yeah. various people entered their computer algorithms, yeah. and, was, oh. and they played against each other, yeah. and ultimately the winner was tit for tat. Yeah. So yeah. it was a four-line code yeah. that was that one out. So I wonder if you have a so you don't mean like an experimental observed game, but a, a, a strat strategy game? Right? Yeah, a competition strategy game for strategies. Just to see what is a better strategy, because these uh, your experiments are very hard to implement in yeah. in the field, right? Yeah. Because they're, yeah. You I might see. not have the approval of nations. You might have the Indian tag factor, the short term tag factor, because political, uh, there may be influence from political positions, and they keep changing from uh, year to year. There's another very, I think, very interesting aspect is that the, lo the utilities of the losses are changing because each year climate change it gets worse. Yeah. So I mean, in, yeah. again, in the dynamic uh, yeah. 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 version, yeah. or yeah. taking bomb or whatever, yeah. right? That you've got to act on. It. And so this yeah. Yeah. Is that puts um, more press pressure on on the agents. I, I had read the paper that you sent me, and most of your book, and you mentioned this. Um, Finding, if I remember, finding a box in a row, right? Um, is there a time element to that? Yeah. Yeah. And there could be, I mean, the loss gets worse and worse. Yeah. That, that, that the loss or the, or the risk, because oh, yeah. the difference. Yeah. Following up on what Anidia and David were saying, I, I can imagine that an agent based model might be the most yeah. realistic way to implement an ARA yeah. in this situation. Okay. Yeah. We had um, proposed an agent-based model of initial proposal, not with ARA, um, and I think we realized by the time we proposed the second one that um, some sense this isn't about a lot of heterogeneous agents. I mean, kind of like, right, right, but like several other handful of countries, and so um, emergent behavior from heterogeneous agents isn't really representative of how this decision is being made, at least not for